Hello and welcome. Today we have a news laundry interviews Papa CJ, who is uh, one of India's most well known stand up artists, stand up comics. And I use the word artists, I'll tell you why. But before we do that, let's just plug your show, uh, Naked, which I watched and I loved. I will tell you, Papa, I thought, not Papa, CJ. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who, of course, doesn't feel cold while I'm here in three layers, you're here in a t-shirt. I've just had a hot shower, man. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. Okay, so, um, a great show, uh, and it's been invited to Soho uh, yeah. in another week, and also Broadway in New York. Yes. Yeah. So that's pretty unusual for an Indian artist to go there, isn't it? Or yeah, is it? I don't know. Well, it's, it's fantastic because, you know, I don't... Uh, all my life, I've, uh, I haven't really ever marketed myself or tried to mm. hire PR or stuff like that. So the Soho Theatre, they wrote to me and invited me. And the same thing with the shows on, on Broadway. So it was very so flattering. for me, it was like, it was fantastic. Yeah. No, not flattering, but just it's phenomenal. No, I think it's fantastic. It's a great honor to... I mean, the club in Broadway has been headlined by Robin Williams, Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld. And now, Papa CJ. <laughs> I'll just uh, give your background to many of our viewers who wouldn't know it. In fact, this was new to me also. You've performed over 2,000 shows across five continents. You've won uh, awards as Asia's India's best stand up uh, comedian. Uh, you hold an MBA in, from the University of Oxford. I don't know why this is here, uh, but congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You have an MBA? No, sir. I'll, 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 I'll be, Ox Oxford University doesn't put me in their brochure, okay? They don't say, come spend. <laughs> 30,000 pounds on an MBA, you can be a stand-up comedian one day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, you have also performed with Russell Peters in Amsterdam. And you were on uh, The Last Comic Standing. I've seen that on TV. You know, it's funny because I did that show uh, about seven or eight years ago. Are you serious? And you look the same. They're showing it in India now. And I've, I've only seen one episode of that show ever, which I saw last week, uh, which is one that I was on. I've never even seen the show. When the show happened, my, I had just moved back to India. Have there been any other Indian comics on that show? No. Okay, you're the only one. Because no. yeah. I saw you were up to the semi-finals, right? No, I was in the top ten. I wow. got to the final. So what was that like, yeah? You know, actually it was strange because I had just moved back to India mm. after seven or eight years in London. My agent called me up and said, listen, there's this show called, called Last Comic Standing. So I said, what's the deal? So he said, well, it's, it's a free ticket to Miami. I'm <laughs> like, yeah, baby. <laughs> I mean, so literally two weeks later, I was on this plane. And that year, I was part of the international audition. So I think from 27, 28 different countries, they had about 150 comics, from which they shortlisted two who would go to the semifinals. Mm. Uh, so there were 32 people in the semifinals from over 3,000 comics. And for me, the excitement was, dude, I'm performing in Vegas. You know, 2,000 seat yeah. auditorium in Vegas. And then I got into the final, which is the top 10. But for me, it was kind of done by then, because in the final, then you get into a house and it becomes a reality show. Now, oh, okay. I'm, I haven't seen yeah, that Yeah, so bit. that's how it happens. But they don't show that bit here. They just show up to the stage performances. You know, I don't even know. I haven't even seen the show. So um, Okay, I just want to... Um, I watched your last show, uh, CJ, uh, Naked, um, which is a fantastic show. Uh, and I'll be very honest with you, I've watched a few of your shows earlier, but I don't really come to your shows because sure. I'm fixated on um, political comedy. I'm a political kida. Yeah. I have that kida in me. Yeah. And much of your comedy is not political. It's yeah. you know, more... Uh, yeah, agree. But this one, Naked, it's not even a regular stand-up comic show. It, mm. I mean, there were parts with the audience, you know, naming me or crying. I wasn't because I'm a guy. <laughs> okay, fifty percent of the men who come to that show cry at some point. But then point. they're not men. <laughs> no kidding. But there were people crying in the audience, yeah. and then you take them on this like emotional roller coaster. It was a fantastic show, unlike anything I've seen. But one thing that I wanted to ask you before we talk about other things about that yeah. show, you start off by saying, "If any of you will be offended by what I'm going to say, yeah, leave now. You have paid and you've come. There's section 295A." Yeah. under which that Baba, Ram Rahim, uh, this yeah. thing, Kuku, yeah. Sharda was arrested. Yeah. Um, now, while it was very funny and, you know, people laughed and you, yeah. you do that whole thing really well, yeah. you start off a show by that. He starts off by saying, if you'll be offended, leave now, because I'm going to say stuff that's offensive. Yeah. Isn't it really sad in a country that chest beats itself over the greatest democracy in the world, Tunta, uh, artist has to start his show like that? No. So, I'm... I think a little bit differently when it comes to this issue. So more than anything else, I said that almost as a joke, hmm. right? Saying that, you know, if you happen to worship anything... Right. Thank uh, you, Shilaji. That's Shilaji. That's Shilaji. Papa Sijay. Uh, saying, if you happen to worship anything, hmm. uh, I might like 
I might make fun of tables. That might be very precious to you. Thank you. Hmm. So it is almost as a joke saying, you know, there is this 295A, you will get a full but refund. But it's true as well. No, so here's the difference, right? I find, I've been doing comedy for about 11 years, uh, India for the last six or seven. I've almost never had, had a problem. So as comedians, I don't think we have to think about what we say as much as where we say it. Now, when you come for a live comedy show, I can manage that atmosphere because I can convey to the audience what my intent is. Mm. Right? Intent is a very important part of offense. Uh, and I can manage their expectations and they get the context of why I'm saying certain things. Now, the second you put that on TV, the second you put it on the internet, it's viewed by thousands or millions of people who weren't in that room. Mm. So they don't get who you are as a person or why you're saying it. Now, I don't have a lot of content on the public domain in terms of digital stuff. So I can manage that, that, that environment. So this was almost as a joke. I've almost never had a problem. Mm. You'd be surprised that uh, there's parts of this show uh, where I take bits of clothing off. Mm -hmm. right? I'm uh, a friend of mine, uh, Abish, in fact, told me that I'm one of the most heckled comedians in India. Who, oh, you or he? Me. Oh, OK. Because apparently I'm asking for it. Okay. But I am very interactive in my shows. Hmm. Last night, I can show you, it's on my phone, hmm. I have a contract from a comedy club in Boston. Hmm. This is like the birthplace of stand-up. Hmm. The contract specifically says, no nudity allowed, this is a no heckling club, the audience is not allowed to heckle you, and you're not allowed to heckle the audience. In my experience, and when it comes to corporate shows, hmm. India is far more tolerant and open than, say, the US or the UK. You've got to be a lot more careful. Yeah, with what corporate you say culture there. there is is very. Yeah. No, what I'm trying to say is that, like what you said, within that, uh, within that audience, yeah. it's in your control. Although I think it's not, because I have a friend Sanjay Rajora. Yeah. I've attended a show of his where he yeah. makes a lot of jart jokes. Yeah. And one jart from the audience came and said, "How can you say that?" There, look, there are idiots everywhere. Let's let's face it. Okay. So it's it, you can never control it. All I'm saying is that, I, does it bother you that? And again, it's not used no, no, very two, often. So two, two different things. One is, I sometimes joke about this, saying that we're the largest democracy on the planet, mm. and we are also the largest hypocrisy on the planet. Mm. Right? It's almost psychological in terms of how you have to work your audience. Mm. You have to get them to give you permission to do what you want to do. Everybody loves the stuff, but they don't want to be seen to be laughing at certain jokes. Once you learn how to work around that, then you've got them on your side. I understand, that as an yeah. artist, yeah. but I'm saying purely from the fact that we have mm. laws from whatever, 1847, yeah. 1920, yeah. which can be pulled out and used, because the thing is, you, again, pardon me, but I disagree, you think yeah. you're in control, you're not. The yeah. way someone wants to come you, yeah. uh, come after you, they will oh, come yeah. after you. Oh, absolutely. You, you, can, you can't do jack. Absolutely. Okay, so if someone says, okay, I want to get Papa, Sure. I want to get CJ. They'll come after See, you. It doesn't matter whether... The nature of our laws, they are so ancient. Hmm. Our judicial system, everything is under such, such a burden that nobody has the time to look at these things hmm. until something happens and they say, wait a second, this law has been around since when? Hmm. I mean, so, I, I mean, I, I joke about it saying, look, the British have left, but their rules remain. Right. You know? In fact, you, this is one of the lines I, from one of the things show. I had, Correct. Uh, okay, now, uh, your show, Naked, it's not... Uh, conventional stand-up act. Now, from my experience of what the comedy I've seen, yeah. I haven't seen anything like it. Just tell me, are there, it's more, uh, for our viewers, without giving any spoilers away, uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's an autobiographical show. It, yeah. it tells you the journey about Papa CJ, about how he became a stand-up, how stand-ups first start off with the easy jokes, yeah. make a joke about a city, yeah. then moves on a political, and, you know, yeah. that whole evolution. Yeah. But there's a lot of uh, really sad stuff, you know, the really yeah. low points of your life, and you really describe them in great detail. Yeah. A, dude, I mean, I mean, respect, Thank not you. many people can be that naked in front of an audience. Sure. I mean, metaphorically. Uh, otherwise, everyone can be naked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is there any like this? I mean, I'm not saying you're Anu Malik, but yeah. I, I'm just asking, is this a new format or? You know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a big one for theoretical analysis. Mm. You know, this whole, there are too many people who study and break it down and it's just a story that, I mean, the time had come for me to tell it. 
you know and i don't feel bound by a genre in terms of it has to be comedy it has to my audience is coming into that room for 90 minutes for me to entertain them or tell them a story or whatever the case might be why do i have to be bound by it has to be like this it has to be like that uh, it's quite new to me as well because uh, when it comes to comedy i'm a control freak in that normally it's just me and a microphone and i'm in control of everything here I'm relying on somebody else to do the sound, somebody else to do, there's a lighting cue, there's hmm. bits of elements that go out of my control. But I don't, I don't look at it from the point of view of I'm trying to define a new genre or I'm trying to, this is just what I'm doing. And when you said it was time for you to tell this story, why now? I think this, this particular show, I mean in comedy they say it takes you 10 years to find your voice in stand-up hmm. because uh, for the first time, we are thrown into a field where, again, I say theoretically because of the things you spoke about, we're in a, in a space where there are no rules, there are no boundaries, there are no societal norms which say you can say this, you can't say this. So in the early stages, you just want to keep people happy. You know, say, I, I want to make them laugh, I want that confidence. But eventually, you're in a space that, because there are no rules, there are no boundaries, you start thinking, what are the things that I want to talk about? What's important to me? You know, so some people go towards politics, some people go to whatever. So stand-up is an incredible journey of, uh, of discovery, of inward discovery. Hmm. You know, you're literally opening up those walls inside and going deeper and thinking about how do I actually feel without somebody saying this is how you should think or you shouldn't think or can do, can't do. And eventually where you get to a point where you're not trying to please everyone. You're just saying this is what I want to talk about. Hmm. I mean, if you think of the famous comedians, Today when you go to see a Chris Rock or a Seinfeld or a Russell Peters, you know what to expect. You don't like their stuff? Don't go. Like you said, you don't like my earlier shows, that doesn't work for you, fine, it's subjective. But eventually as you discover your voice, your audience finds you. Mm. Today a guy who's coming for a Papa City show kind of knows what to expect. Although, not, with although not with this one. Yeah, so it's it sort is. of, you know, That's what but I'm with, saying, with yeah. the more famous guys. So I'm yeah. still on that journey of, of playing with, not okay. who I want to be. But I'm just, this is what works for me now. But the biggest fine. difference is that, you know, in your earlier shows, yeah. you know, you, you talk about pop culture or other yeah. stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so if someone, let's say like me, says, you know, this is, it, it's not politics, so it doesn't really get me. So it, yeah. it's not something that, you know, especially I know you're a mature adult individual. It, it, you will not be personally offended. Fine, you know, you like political stand-up, you like someone take, you know, I go yeah. for pop culture, I perform yeah. for universities. But this is your story. Yeah. It is CJ and it's very personal. And you yeah. give details about your life which yeah. a lot of guys wouldn't even give to their lovers, you know. Yeah. Um, so if someone did rejects that, yeah. it's you know, it, it is personal. You can't say I won't take it personally. So that's what I'm trying to say. How difficult is it to come out there and just because you know, the first time you performed this, how hard was it heart pounding? Because the audience says, Boo, I don't like your life, and you have just laid it out for them. See if uh, <coughs> If you can't handle rejection, mm. you can't be a stand-up comedian. Mm. It's, the, it's our job, dude. That, that, that's how we work. In fact, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of entrepreneurial stuff where they say oh, failure is important for success, etc. Mm -hmm. In stand-up, you cannot succeed if you don't fail. Because we learn nothing from a good show. I'll do a good show, I'll walk off stage thinking, okay, dude, I'm the king, right? Mm. But in a bad show, I get feedback every 15 seconds. I've got to adapt on the spot. And if I don't, on the way home, I've got to think about if I'm in that situation again, what can I do differently? That's what makes you grow. Now today, a corporate show in India, I can do it in my sleep. Literally, you can wake me up from be my bed, there'll be 500 people there, I only have to get up from my bed. Now, when you get to that level of comfort, you stop growing. You mm. start st and it's very easy to sit in that space, do the same stuff forever. Then you've got to push yourself and say, okay, what can I do to make myself uncomfortable? What's next? And it, there is that risk of failure, there is that rejection. Because it's stand-up, it's not like a film where you say, the script was bad. Sure. You're the writer, you're the director, you're the actor, you're the dancer. Yeah, I, I, so I when get, they reject the show, they reject you. I get that, but yeah. there's a big difference. Please have your coffee, it's yeah. getting cold. But oh, there's a difference in huh? being rejected for, let's say, a gig you did or a, you mm -hmm. know, a routine you did on, let's say, YouTube videos or yeah. Facebook yeah. and being rejected because you were telling your innermost secrets. There's a big difference. So what I'm saying is that the first time you perform Naked, yeah. which is, you know, a show that is uh, yeah. uh, about your personal yeah. life, yeah. the difference in the two, yeah. how 
how much harder was your heart pounding when you performed that? I think or there's no difference? I think it's much tougher because firstly, I'm doing something that's completely new to me. Hmm. You know, I'm, uh, I'll tell you what's really worked for me in this show and what has, like the first time I tried out Naked, it was two and a half hours long with no break. Two and a half hours. The show you saw was maybe 75 to 90 minutes. Okay. Say 70 minutes of content plus 20 minutes of me yeah. playing with the audience. So I think, uh, yeah, sure it's difficult because you are opening up a very personal side of yourself. But I suppose <coughs> the more I do it, I'm not asking you to, to like me. Hmm. I'm just saying this is my story. I'm just saying this is how I felt. This was my journey. And what I found works really well with this show is that and I've done this show in multiple countries now, is that every person who comes for that show at some point in their lives has gone through similar emotions or similar feelings and they identify with it. At some point they're like, wait, that's, that's my story, it's not just his. You know, I've gone through this or I've gone through that and felt similarly. And the emotional connection that I've been able to make with my audience in this show is phenomenal. I cannot begin to tell you how special there is this. I saw that at the end of the show. There are people who, after the show, they know, nobody wants to congratulate me. They want to hug you. Mm. And I've had people who've written to me about how it's inspired them. I've had people who've written to me and talked to me about how they're going to look at life positively. I've had people who have written to me and spoken to me about various really negative things that they, that have happened to them in their lives which they say that I'm now going to look at that differently and get past that. So, I mean, it's phenomenal the the kind of connect it has created. When you said the first time you tried the show was two and a half hours long, what does that mean? How do you try the show? Like you go friends and family, how does it work? How no, do you I booked a small theatre with a hundred people. Friends and family means nothing. Okay. You don't know something works <coughs> until you do it in front of an audience. So you booked a theatre and you performed this? I booked Akshara, okay. had a hundred people in. In mm. fact, I did... The show is being prepared for the Melbourne Festival, mm. which I was doing in March, April. Mm. So I booked five shows at Akshara in Delhi and one at the Hive in, in Bombay. And one of the shows in Delhi was an, was an expat show. So it was said international audience, not only, but specifically targeted at them. So I could get a feel for what worked for those audiences. And how, was, how were the initial shows? Uh, well, it was two and a half hours from which I eventually brought it down to ballpark 75 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, over various iterations, you record it, you listen back, what worked, what didn't work, what were bits of the story that they really went with or they didn't go with. And what was new for me at that point were there were certain bits where there was no laughter and there, was, there were serious bits and as a comedian you would normally think ah, I should probably drop that because it doesn't get that. But for me that was a very important part of that story and I was like no, I'm going to keep that. Because you wanted that. Because I wanted it. Right. And for me it, it, it formed an important part of hmm. you know, the story I was trying to tell. Hmm. And you know these things there isn't, there isn't a theory to it. There is, I mean, you can do some science when you're doing sort of snappy comedy. I mean, when I started doing stand-up, I had spreadsheets with jokes. Are you serious? I'm serious. I mean, I came from an MBA. I had spreadsheets with quality of the joke, the timing, how many lasts per minute. Mm -hmm. When you do the King Gong show in, at the Comedy Store in London, you've got to try and last five minutes in front of a rowdy audience. Oh, and is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three people have red cards. When those three go up, you're off. Most and that's where you used to perform? Yeah, well, that's, that's intimidating. Right. I my craft. Mm -hmm. Most comedians last 90 seconds. I've never been gonged off that show because I learned how to instantly be funny and take care of any heckling or trouble when it came. Okay, I, um, comedy is, in my view, a yeah. great change agent. Yeah. Uh, socially, politically, on social norms and political, yeah. you know, culture. Yeah. Um, you have also touched upon in this show about a certain um, law yeah. in India which you find, uh, you know, yeah. not appropriate. Yeah. Um, do you think in India, yeah. comedy is used enough as a change agent or is it still in its infancy? So, by and large, log chutko le See, it has great potential to be used as a change agent, mm. but I don't think anybody should, you know, we have a, we live in a world which has got too much value judgment mm. and it has increased so much more with social media. I mean, everybody on Twitter is an expert on everything. This is what you should do. I mean, this, there's this intellectual arrogance of how you should, you know, this comedian is like, it's none of your business, dude. 
Each person has their own voice. There is some comedian who wants to be more political. There's somebody who wants to tell a personal story. There's somebody, and people often say, oh, so-and-so comedian is vulgar. You know, where do you draw the line? Mm. The audience draws the line. Mm. Right? Why is that comedian cracking the joke? Because you guys keep laughing at it. You want him to stop, stop laughing. Right? They're encouraging it. If a comedian doesn't want to stand there and not be laughed with. Right? If you guys keep laughing, he cracks the joke. And then you say, oh, he's vulgar. No, you are vulgar. That's why he's cracking the joke. Hmm. So, I don't think it's a... Sure. It's Do you a, have a problem you, with bad language? On, I, you don't... You I don't, don't really, really use a lot bad of bad language. language. You see, the youth in our country hmm. think, seem to think of stand-up comedy as... Of, or comedians as celebrities. Hmm. They're still in this thing that... The, just the fact that a guy used bad language or picked on somebody in a position of authority is enough for them to go, right? But with a mature audience, I mean, that shock value goes for 30 seconds. Then what have you got? You need personality, you need presence, you need... You have to impress them with your content and your performance. So, uh, sure, humor is a hugely powerful tool for social change. But it is not for somebody else to say, yeah, you guys should be doing this. Yeah, but I'm asking, do you think it's used enough? Of course, I'm not saying... No, of course it's not used enough, yeah. It's not, I mean, the, the industry itself is in a state of infancy, hmm. right? And it's going to grow and there will be comedians who will come out and say that we want to use this as a tool for political change. Mm. In fact, there will be people who, who are activists, right, who will switch, switch to the comedy side. Mm. Why should comedians go into, mm. you, know, you know, going for social change? Right. There will be activists who say, listen, this is a powerful tool. Why don't I work with a comedian to help me to get this message across in digestible format. I mean, today everything is about entertainment. Right. Cricket has come down to T20 and people dancing on the side, right? Mm. So, if you can entertain people and still have them take away a message, it's going to be memorable. You know, why are online videos getting so popular? Because people are like, oh, that's funny or that's interesting or... And also it breaks format from, you know, what conventional TV. Yeah. <coughs> okay, I have one last question. Yeah. When you pick someone and <coughs> you and a lot of other uh, artists, Yeah. An important element of your show is, you know, that that board that you bounce off yeah. is some from the audience. Yeah. And uh, the one I attended, you know, both the guys you picked, yeah. uh, in fact, all three of the three generations yeah. Yeah. were fantastic. Yeah. And how do you pick that guy? Suppose the guy you pick is a real tuss. Yeah. How, how do you identify? Is, is then you change what's halfway? Okay, this guy's not what's working. A, what's like a tuss? As in, you know, either he'll get offended or. You know, the one I had that, that okay. uh, they were, they're either they're passive, but they're fun yeah. or they come up with, you know, a bumbling response or okay. they really enjoy it with you that my wife's not here, she's five rows back. Okay. But some guy may be just, So, 90% of it, a lot of it is management of energy, right? Mm. And today, having done 2000 shows, I can look into the eyes of the person and know when I should draw back, when I can go, see, I'm very... I pick on people, sure, a lot, but I have no problem teasing them or embarrassing them. I never want to be hurtful. Hmm. I'm very careful. I don't want a single guy walking out thinking, yeah, I'm not going to go back to a show. So you can identify that and somehow I don't know what it is, but maybe it's a sixth sense, but I always seem to pick the right guys. Hmm. Either that or they just opt in. <laughs> right? And it's never pre-planned. Sometimes people say, oh, did you plant somebody? No, hmm. I have no clue who's going to be there. And I'm also not the kind of guy who will only pick on the first row. Right. I'm the kind of guy who will say, turn the house lights up. I will walk back 15 rows down and find somebody there. But I like that element of uncertainty, not knowing what's going to be happening. It could be me. And it's not just the youth. I mean, if you'll notice in my audience, the average age is probably 40. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. a good 10, 15 years older than sort of most comedians. Than youth. In, Thank in, you. In India, <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. No, but most if you go, if you walk into a Canvas Laugh Club in Mumbai. Uh, I get what you're saying. 25. Yeah. But I find that a lot of people are really open to it. Mm. Most people are actually open to it, contrary to what popular belief might be. Mm -hmm. And they, they're happy to have that risk element. Be a part so of it. I don't know what it is that makes me pick them, but... Uh, Maybe it's just a sense or they've got that look on their face or sometimes you'll see a combination of people sitting differently or separately mm. and you'll just say, ah, this could be interesting. But if you find there's nothing there to work with, you know when to pull back and say, okay, this is like a comedy cul-de-sac, let me, let me you know, pull away from well, here. Or if it looks like the kind of person who might be offended, you're like, no, I'll, I'll stay away from that. I don't want to egg on, I mean, 
Accepted. You don't want to just be nasty, right? Yeah. I get that. And often <coughs> what happens, you know, uh, say when comedy started in India, you had the comedy store open up in Bombay, mm. and there'd be these comedians with 20 years experience who'd come and work with the crowd. And then you see these new comics who see them sometimes, and they'll go and, th and they think that hosting a show means abusing the audience or picking on them. Yeah. They don't. And that doesn't work then. It doesn't work because I've you seen, don't understand yeah. the nuances of that 20 years of experience and how they play yeah. with the audience. I've seen someone fall flat doing that. It's very embarrassing. You feel bad for the guy on stage. And actually. I feel bad when they, sometimes there'll be an audience where there's 100 people and there's five foreigners. And that foreigner is picked on but in a way that is not nice. Yeah. And halfway through the show they leave. Mm. You know, I felt really nice. I did this show in Bangalore last week, Pune last week. And I had somebody write a blog, there were six white girls on the second row on the right, saying, Lou, this guy translated the jokes for us, we were the only six white people there, and it felt so. So I think that's what comedy should be, include them. Mm. They don't mind being picked on if you, if you do it nicely. Sure. Uh, and it's just, I don't buy into the negativity, uh, negativity, I don't buy into the people saying, oh, this is how it should be. No, dude, this is my journey. You don't want to come, don't come. But for the people who are there, I mean, for me, I'm in the happiness business, mm. not in the comedy business. I'm there to make you happy, and I think I think an audience can send sense positive energy. If if you are there for them, they can feel that, and they let you do. Okay, two happy endings. Uh -huh. CJ, <laughs> my friend. Uh, good luck with um, your show Naked. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a fantastic show, and uh, I'm not just plugging it because he's here giving it to you. I've enjoyed that show so much. It was amazing. Thank you. And good luck with your uh, journey. And I look forward to the next one. As personal as, as honest as this. Thank you, sir. All right. If you enjoyed that, click up here to support us and down here to subscribe. Be sure to check out our older episodes and the other stuff we do like Can You Take It, I Agree, panel discussions, comics and animations and much, much more.